you breathing? I don't think so. Have you checked? Michelle? She is cold. Okay. Listen to me. Did you see what happened? I don't know. Kathy, come here, sweetie. I'm here with our daughter. In our first case today, we will delve into the depths of a chilling attack on a defenseless individual. We'll discuss the life stories behind this tragedy and the dilemmas they faced. We will also witness one sister's worst discovery, a 911 call, and the shocking details of that discovery. Brace yourselves, we're stepping into the crime scene now. Aaron Pajic, born in 1998 in Perth, Western Australia, showed unique behaviors from a young age that led his family to seek medical advice. After evaluations, Aaron was diagnosed with Asperger syndrome, which affects social interaction and communication skills. While this can result in repetitive behaviors, individuals with Asperger's often demonstrate high intelligence and excel in specific areas. Despite facing challenges in connecting with peers, Aaron had a deep passion for video and computer games. After graduating from high school, he pursued further education at a technical college in Australia, where he excelled academically. Known for his friendly and sociable nature, Aaron dreamed of working in Japan, but tragic events changed his course. Gemma Victoria Lilly, born in 1991 in Stanford, England, exhibited intelligence and sociability, yet her challenging family life left a lasting impact. Her mother's mental illness created turmoil at home, leading her father to seek custody for a fresh start. Nevertheless, emotional scars from her early years ran deep. Fascinated by violence from a young age, Gemma's behaviors like mimicking villains and writing about killers became more prominent over time. Dealing with dyslexia and autism diagnoses, she became increasingly isolated from her peers. By the time she was 15, Gemma had penned a novel titled Playzone, based on a killer named SOS, which stands for Son of Sam, inspired by the real-life serial killer David Berkowitz. Berkowitz was responsible for the murders of at least eight people in the 1970s, operating around New York. The year following the publication of her book, Gemma left school due to poor grades, inappropriate behavior, and violence towards her classmates. In 2010, driven by a desire for a fresh start, she decided to travel abroad. Her journey led her to Perth in Western Australia, where she stayed with a close friend of her father. Even though Gemma could be a bit annoying sometimes, the man decided to step up and help her out financially. He even arranged part-time gigs for her. Gemma worked as a cashier at a supermarket and later as an assistant at a tattoo parlor, a job she really enjoyed. This led to her getting adorned with numerous tattoos. She loved her life in Australia, but as her visa was nearing expiration, she realized her options to stay legally were limited. In an attempt to outsmart the system, she turned to deceitful tactics. In 2012, she entered a marriage of convenience with her gay friend Gordon Galbraith, whom she affectionately referred to as Gacy, due to his resemblance to one of her idols, John Wayne Gacy. By leveraging this union, Gemma aimed for permanent residency, successfully making Australia her forever home. During her time in Australia, Gemma contributed articles to the serial killer magazine in the US, delving into stories about notorious criminals like Eric Edgar Cook However, tragedy struck soon after Gemma obtained her residency when Gordon tragically took his own life, complicating Gemma's legal status posthumously. To navigate this hurdle, Gemma fabricated a story about recently parting ways with her deceased husband, ensuring her prolonged stay in the country. Amidst this turmoil, Gemma crossed paths with Trudy Lennon through a mutual connection. Despite their significant age gap, the two women developed a close bond, united by a shared penchant for violence. After meeting, a romantic relationship blossomed between them, 
further entangling their lives. Trudy, a TAFE student, introduced Gemma to Aaron Pudgich, a proficient computer enthusiast recognized in their circle for his technical skills and Asperger's diagnosis. Unfortunately, Aaron's vulnerabilities made him an easy target for the sinister intentions lurking around him. One morning in June 2016, Trudy dropped off her kids at school and then rang up Aaron for help with fixing her computer. She sweetened the deal by offering to play games together as a token of her gratitude. Aaron, always ready to help, especially with computers and video games, agreed to stop by. Little did Aaron know, she was unknowingly setting the stage for a situation straight out of a suspense novel. When Aaron arrived at Trudy's place, she led him to the living room to check out the problematic computer, even offering him a cup of coffee. Fast forward two days without any sign of Aaron returning home, his family started to worry and reported him missing. The authorities took the case seriously due to Aaron's age and Asperger's condition. They traced his last call to Trudy Lennon on the day of their meeting at the shopping center. Security cameras at the shopping center captured Aaron getting into Trudy's car, joined by her friend Gemma in the passenger seat. A week later, a search at Gemma and Trudy's residence uncovered a disturbing assortment of knives, scalpels, and a bone saw, along with notes detailing torture methods. In the garage, a pot with flesh soaking in acid was found. In Gemma's bedroom, they noticed that a carpet had recently been removed and the area was now covered with a piece of furniture. The discoveries within the house were deeply unsettling, yet none provided a clue to Aaron's whereabouts. Despite Gemma and Trudy's claims of innocence regarding Aaron's disappearance, they couldn't explain the existence of a freshly laid patio in the backyard. Further investigation led to the discovery of Aaron's body wrapped in cling film. The autopsy showed signs of drowning and multiple stab wounds, including punctures in his lungs, liver, and a severed carotid artery. After the unsettling finds at their home, the area was declared a crime scene, and Gemma and Trudy were taken into custody. On June 22, 2016, a shocking turn of events unfolded when Gemma and Trudy were arrested and charged with the murder of Aaron Paget. Initially, both denied any connection to Aaron during police questioning, trying to distance themselves from the crime. However, as evidence against them piled up, their stories began to shift. They each tried to portray themselves as innocent while pointing fingers at the other person. Eventually, Trudy decided to place the blame for the murder on Gemma. She depicted herself as a mere bystander who unintentionally led Aaron to the house Trudy admitted to witnessing Gemma strangling and stabbing Aaron, acknowledging her role in holding him down during the vicious attack, aiding in cleaning the crime scene, and concealing evidence, although Gemma contested these allegations. Gemma, on the other hand, offered a different narrative. She claimed that they had all gathered at the house for coffee, but she suddenly felt lightheaded and passed out, suspecting that Trudy might have drugged her. When she regained consciousness at 2 p.m., disoriented and inquiring about Aaron's whereabouts, Trudy assured her that he would be seen at the university the following day. Both women vehemently denied any involvement in the murder and refused to admit guilt. But the mounting evidence painted a starkly different picture. Surveillance footage and phone records pointed towards a premeditated crime. The footage revealed that upon Aaron's arrival, Trudy guided him to the living room under the guise of needing help with his computer before offering him coffee. While Aaron was engrossed with the computer, Gemma approached quietly from behind and attempted to strangle him with a wire. Despite Aaron's resistance, he was subdued, and as Trudy restrained him, Gemma proceeded to brutally stab him numerous times in the neck and chest until he succumbed to his injuries. Instead of following through with their initial plan to dissolve the body in acid, they opted to bury it in a shallow grave in the backyard, meticulously cleaning the scene to obscure any traces of the horrific event. Even after the heinous act, Gemma displayed an eerie sense of exhilaration. 
sharing newfound sensations and emotions with Trudy in a text message. Their mistaken belief that they had successfully deceived others regarding Aaron's disappearance was shattered by their own incriminating trail, such as store footage capturing their purchase of supplies like a saw, concrete, and a substantial quantity of hydrochloric acid prior to the crime. Following a five-week trial on November 1, 2017, the jury sentenced both Gemma and Trudy to life imprisonment. During the sentencing, neither woman displayed any emotion. The judge noted that their actions were not motivated by hatred, revenge, or personal gain, but rather by a perverse excitement deriving from taking a life and fulfilling their darkest fantasies. Even following the trial, Gemma's father continued to protest her innocence. In 2018, Trudy faced an attack from another inmate in prison who poured scalding water over her back, chest, and arms, causing severe burns encompassing more than 20% of her body. The assailant cited disgust at Trudy's crimes as the motive for the assault and received a five-year sentence for causing harm. In September 2020, Aaron's father received $25,000 in compensation for the mental and emotional agony he endured in the aftermath of the tragedy. Before we dive into our next story, if you could take a moment to hit that like button, it would mean the world to us. A single click for you is a huge boost of encouragement for us. We're off to Raleigh, the capital of North Carolina and the state's second most populous city. Michelle Young, born on February 17, 1977, hails from Seville, New York. Her family describes her as a vivacious and enthusiastic teenager brimming with confidence. At high school, she even captained the cheerleading squad. Initially aiming to become a tax lawyer, she changed direction after graduation, pursuing a finance degree at North Carolina State University. After four years of hard work, she earned a master's degree in accounting and secured a position at a local accounting firm. In February 2001, while celebrating her birthday at a local bar with friends, she met Jason. They bonded over their alumni status at State University and their shared love for football, quickly developing a strong relationship. Despite living in another city, Jason made regular trips to Raleigh to be with Michelle. Their bond grew so deep that Jason eventually relocated to Raleigh and they began living together. Just two years into their relationship, they were surprised to learn that Michelle was pregnant earlier than they had planned. With the high costs of childbirth in the US and no health insurance, they decided to tie the knot. In August 2003, they had a grand wedding and welcomed their daughter Cassidy into the world six months later. Michelle's sister, Meredith, also moved to Raleigh to support the family, prompting a move to a larger home. Michelle's mother, Linda, took on a significant role in raising Cassidy, despite occasional tensions as Jason wasn't entirely comfortable living with his mother-in-law. Nonetheless, Michelle and Linda shared a strong mother-daughter bond and communicated openly. This closeness sometimes caused friction between Jason and Linda, particularly when Michelle turned to her mom for advice during marital challenges. In the spring of 2006, Michelle surprised Jason with news of an unplanned second pregnancy. They visited Jason's parents to celebrate, but tragedy struck while they were out shopping. Thankfully, their daughter was safe with her grandparents during a car accident that left Michelle and Jason emotionally shaken. A few days later, Michelle experienced a miscarriage bringing sorrow to the couple. However, they received hopeful news. Michelle was pregnant again. While Michelle embraced the pregnancy with joy, the excitement seemed to diminish for Jason as his frequent business trips began to create distance from the family. On the evening of November 2, 2006, Jason bid farewell to his wife Michelle and their daughter Cassidy before heading out on a business trip. The next day started off like any other for Michelle's sister, Meredith, until she received a call from Jason that turned everything upside down. Jason had accidentally sent an online handbag receipt to their home printer. He urgently contacted Meredith to retrieve it before Michelle could discover it, 
as it was meant to be a surprise for their upcoming third wedding anniversary. Upon entering the house through the typically locked back door, Meredith was struck by an unsettling silence inside. Michelle's purse and keys lay in the kitchen, but Michelle was nowhere to be found. Only the faint sound of the family dog whimpering broke the silence. Meredith called out for her sister, but received no response. As she searched the house, what she encountered in the bedroom was a horrifying scene that would haunt her forever. Michelle lay lifeless on the floor, covered in blood with splatters on the walls, a tragic end to her life. Nearby, Cassidy appeared from beneath the bed, confused and wearing fresh pajamas. Meredith scooped up the two-year-old, comforting her, and exited the room. Emergency. I need an ambulance. Okay. It's an emergency. What address are you at, ma'am? Ma'am, what's your phone number in case I lose you? Problem, tell me exactly what happened. Um, I, I think my sister's dead. Okay, tell me what happened, ma'am. I have no idea. Oh, my God. All right, stay on the phone with me, please. Um, what's your name? Meredith Fisher. Uh, Meredith. And this is a young address. Oh, my God. Right. Meredith, listen to me, please. Yeah. Are you with the patient now? Yes, yeah, and her daughter. And okay. How old is the patient? And there's blood everywhere. She's 28, 29. 28. Should I try to move her? Listen to me, ma'am. Yeah, I'm going to tell you what to do. Okay. But you need to calm down so we can help her. You said there's blood everywhere? Yes. All right. Is she conscious? No, I don't think so. Should I try to help her? Listen to me, ma'am. I'm listening. Is she breathing? I don't think so. Have you checked? Michelle, she's cold. Okay. Listen to me, did you see what happened? I don't know. Cassidy, come here, sweetie. I'm here with her daughter. Okay. There's, there's like blood footprints all over the house. Okay, listen her to daughter, me. Like her daughter's little footprints. Okay, listen to me. What's your first name? Meredith. All right, Meredith. Yes, sir. Did you see what happened? I, I, I just came here on a fluke. I usually, you know, don't come here during the day. Okay. She shouldn't be home. She should be at work. Like. Okay, listen to me. Yes, sir. Hey, did you know what happened to Mommy? Did she fall? Or do you think she's beyond any help? I don't know, honestly. I, you don't know? All right. I'm normally very good under okay. pressure. We're going to tell you what to do then, okay? Yes, sir. Are you right by her now? I, I'm keeping her daughter out of there. Okay. All right, so you're not with her? I, I'm, I'm right outside the bedroom. All right. Can you get her daughter secured? So can, can you carry the phone into where she's at? Yes. All right, can you secure her daughter? Cassidy, sweetie, can you stay in your room for two seconds, okay? Okay. Okay. Can you close the door for two seconds? I'll be right back in there, okay, sweetie? All right. Can you can you get her on her back? Okay. Oh, my God. Michelle? I don't think so. She's so heavy. I see if you can get her on her back. I really think she's dead. Pardon? I really think she's dead. Okay. You can't roll her over? Not, not easily. Are right, you going to have to try. Hang on, let me, I'm trying to see if I can get her pulse. we got to try to do CPR if we can get her on the back, Meredith. No, she's like cold. She's cold? Okay. Yeah. All right. And her body is stiff. Okay, then don't try. If she's cold, then there's, oh my God, there's I probably nothing that she can do. Her. Should I not touch anything? All right, try not to touch anything more than you did. Was anything out of place or unusual when you came in? This place does not look like what it normally looks like. Okay, what? There's blood in the bed. Okay. All right. Try not to touch anything else, okay? Okay. I just moved the pillow. I just leave everything exactly where it is then. Upon the arrival of authorities, they were met with a harrowing sight. A vicious assault on a pregnant woman casting a dark cloud over the household. The autopsy reports were incredibly disturbing. Michelle's cause of death was determined to be blunt force trauma to the head, resulting in multiple fractures, the loss of several teeth, and brain hemorrhaging. Adding to the heartbreak was the chilling detail of a toy doll found next to Michelle's head, likely placed there by Cassidy. The unsettling part was that there were no signs of forced entry into the home, indicating that the perpetrator may have entered using a key or through an open garage door. Michelle's husband, Jason, was out of town on a business trip when the tragic incident occurred. Despite being thoroughly investigated, he had a solid alibi. Jason had checked into a hotel 430 kilometers away the night before the incident, and his presence there was confirmed on the night of the crime. 
The keycard data revealed that he had only used it once, confirming he was in his hotel room at the time of his wife's tragic demise. Despite his seemingly airtight alibi, suspicions continued to swirl around Jason. This led to interrogations of the hotel staff and a detailed scrutiny of security footage. During a routine check in the early hours, a vigilant hotel employee noticed the third floor emergency exit propped open with a stone, indicating an attempt to go unnoticed. The subsequent security footage revealed the door closing before the camera mysteriously went offline for about half an hour. When a maintenance worker inspected the camera, they discovered it had been purposely adjusted to face the ceiling, raising suspicions as it had not been moved for years. Following Michelle's murder, Jason's behavior began to raise suspicion. He made a flurry of phone calls, which investigators initially saw as the reaction of a grieving husband learning about his wife's tragic fate. However, inconsistencies in gas station transactions and car mileage were noted. A gas station attendant reported seeing Jason refueling his car on the morning of the incident. Despite the station's policy requiring identification or a credit card, Jason allegedly refused to comply, leading to a heated exchange. These peculiar occurrences hinted that Jason might have traveled further than initially believed, a theory supported by the station's sales records. While these revelations deeply troubled authorities, more concrete evidence was needed to formally charge Jason with the crime. As the investigation progressed, more details surfaced about Jason, suggesting a potential connection with another woman. Michelle, who was four months pregnant at the time, found out that while Jason was on a business trip to Florida, he had secretly met up with an old friend named Michelle Money for personal reasons rather than work-related issues. This clandestine meeting raised suspicions especially since Michelle Money had stayed with the couple a month before the tragic event. They had heartfelt conversations about marital problems, which led to frequent messages between Jason and Michelle Money, eventually leading to a romantic relationship. Over a year went by with no arrests related to the murder, prompting investigators to revisit the couple's home for more evidence. The public revelation of Jason's affair with Michelle Money stirred doubts among family and friends who suspected his involvement in the crime and pushed for authorities to take action. Concerns arose among relatives about Cassidy's well-being as she continued to live with her father. After three years of thorough investigation, the police finally arrested Jason for the murder of Michelle Young. Prosecutors built a strong case against him, presenting compelling evidence and witness testimonies to elicit a confession. In June 2011, Jason faced his first trial, which ended inconclusively, leaving the family disheartened. However, seven months later, a more robust case was presented in a second trial, featuring a surprise witness, Michelle Money, Jason's mistress. She testified about their troubled marriage and alleged past harassment by him. Crucial pieces of evidence, such as hotel records, gas station witnesses and testimonies were brought forward, leading the jury to convict Jason of his wife's murder. Consequently, he was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. In 2017, Jason sought a third trial through an appeal, but his request was denied. Many supporters firmly believe in Jason's innocence, claiming he was wrongly convicted and passionately advocating for his release. Meanwhile, Cassidy, now under the guardianship of her Aunt Meredith, continues to navigate life without her mother and with her father behind bars. Before we conclude this video, please be aware that the video on the left may be disturbing. It is recommended for adult viewing only on the right, you'll find a playlist of videos that have been highly appreciated by our viewers.